department of biotechnology and the newly established department which is department of medical science and technology at iit madras his research interests are in the areas of computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence and has written two books in neuroscience he has invented a novel script if you search in google you will find it it's called bharati which ex- which can express uh, all indian languages it's very very novel and innovative script i would uh, request all of you to search in google about bharati script and he also has written many books in popular science and he has translated many books uh, in telugu as well so with this brief introduction i uh, invite professor srinivas chakravarty to take over this session and just to uh, tell all of you there is a lot of interest uh, uh, on this topic and uh, we have received as many as 1700 registrations till now and we received i think more than 50 queries for the query form so there is a lot of interest on this topic sir and we welcome you to this session uh, uh, that we are hosting through beta guru platform thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, good evening everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, balaraju prashant uh, and balaji for making this session happen uh, and really we want to do more of this you know to interact with uh, school students and popular is science so my talk today is uh, titled uh, the whole and its parts history of ideas about brain so i'll talk about uh, history of neuroscience uh, how the ideas about brain have evolved over the millennia not just centuries the talk is titled the whole and its parts basically it refers to a crucial question which people have been grappling with uh, when it comes to understanding brain which is how are from brain functions distributed through the brain through the volume of the brain so there's one school of thought that believed that uh, different functions were located at different points or different locations in the brain the opposite school believed that uh, functions are distributed so every part of the brain controls every function so there was this kind of a dichotomy for a long time and only in the last century also there's more clarity about uh, which school is correct right so with that uh, kind of a, a pivotal question i'll talk about a lot of developments in neuroscience that have happened over uh, the centuries so let's begin this journey so you might be an artist right with the slender fingers and an uncanny ability to uh, work miracles on the canvas with uh, colored strokes or you might be a, an excellent athlete uh, with powerful legs which can propel you at a whopping speed of 28 miles per hour or you might be an actress right uh, with a face that can launch a thousand ships I have to borrow an expression from English poet uh, Christopher Marlowe, right? So, thing is, although people have all these talents, and it is the brain behind, right, is making them express all these talents. We really don't feel the brain. We don't. The brain doesn't make its presence felt in any concrete way compared to other organs, right? Suppose you are hungry and you find these rats running in your tummy, right? You you find tummy making these gurgling sounds, right? So you know that you have a tummy. You know, even though you may not have looked at a scan of your tummy. So similarly, you know, if you are young and you know your uh, your you know, mind and heart are going into towards thoughts of love, right in springtime and all that, right, you can feel the pounding of the heart. So you know that you have something called the heart. You know, you can feel the lubbed up sounds of the heart. But uh, although brain is behind lot of functions, right, behind is our entire life, it, it doesn't make its presence felt because it first of all very securely. uh you know hidden inside the cranial wall that is like a fortress for the brain and therefore you don't even know that you have you know you have a brain uh, unless you take a scan and then it looks like this right it's not something very it looks doesn't look very interesting but it's very powerful so brain is that secret organ that's behind you know everything that we do with our entire life right so people are very curious right uh, what is this brain how does it work and this is a very ancient interest right ancient curiosity that uh, humanity had to understand how brain works so there are all sorts of funny things to understand to answer this question right one thing is some of the earliest attempts that people have made to understand brain uh, don't seem to prove that we have a brain right so uh, so let us uh, begin that journey and go back into the antiquity and see what how people have thought about the brain in, in very distant past so let's begin with uh, ancient egypt So here is a papyrus. It's called Edwin Smith papyrus, named after the person who discovered this. This is supposed to be from 1700 BC, but actually other estimates they date it back to 3000 BC because ancient Egypt, the Egypt of pyramids and pharaohs and all that, that 
uh, usually goes back to 3000 to 3500 BC. So in this uh, papyrus, it talks about a special way of uh, preparing a mummy, right? So we all know that uh, in the in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs, the kings were held in great regard. With, you know, they were venerated. And after their death, uh, they thought that this they thought of kings as some kind of a divine beings, some as kind of immortal creatures. So, so even though there is death, they thought that the body has to be preserved because it's a sacred body. So they went to great lengths to preserve the body. And that's what we call mummies, right? So part of the preparation, so they so the, so they they kept the heart alive. They have, not not alive, sorry, they kept the heart intact, they left it inside the body, they didn't take it out. But they didn't think, think much of the brain. The brain, they thought, is not that important. So they would actually scoop out the brain. So how do you scoop out the brain? You don't have to cut the skull open. Uh, because if you kind of push a needle into the nostril, in fact, that some of the surgical procedures follow that method. So there is a there is a small thin bone called the cribriform plate. Right? If you can penetrate that, you will directly hit the brain. And uh, they would scoop out uh, tissue from that and empty out the skull, right? So other organs are left inside. Then if you go to ancient Greece, right, start with Aristotle, because Aristotle, uh, so you know, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they form a trio, right, of famous scholars of ancient Greece. Aristotle is a third in that, in that order. So uh, unlike the other two, Aristotle had speculated and written extensively about science, about the physical world and what he saw around it. Uh, around himself and, and he commented on how different parts of physical world could be functioning. So he wrote about, uh, so this question of what is the most important organ in the body it was uh, a very important question when people thought about the body's function. So Aristotle thought that the most important organ is the heart and not the brain. In fact, the word that they use is what's called the seat of the soul. The ancient world, they all believed that we have something called a soul. And there's some organ, special organ in the body which supports that soul. And Aristotle sort of thought it's the heart. Right? In fact, uh, his understanding of brain is very kind of condescending. So he thought that brain's job is just to cool the blood. Because the blood coming out of the heart is probably hot and warm. And brain's job is to cool the blood. And actually, the, the fact is opposite. Right? Uh, blood going to the brain helps to cool it a little bit. Because brain's activity is generate a lot of heat. That you might have seen that, you know, or heard that in popular media, you now people are using large computers you know, in, to run these artificial intelligence algorithms, right? You need computer farms. So these computers generate a lot of heat, uh, and therefore you need very expensive air conditioning systems to keep the computers, to keep the room cool and keep the computers cool. So brain is like a computer. So it generates some heat, uh, some level of heat, not as much as uh, the computer does, but brain is very energy efficient. Uh, but uh, the blood going in and out of the brain uh, carries off out some of that heat. So Aristotle speculated a lot of things uh, about how things work in the physical world, and a lot of those speculations are quite wrong. So, for example, he said that uh, when you drop two objects, a heavy object and a light object, right? He said a heavier object falls faster, reaches the ground faster, sooner. So that's obviously we know it's wrong unless you're talking about a very light object like a feather or a piece of cotton or something. Otherwise, reasonably heavy objects, that they all fall at the, the same speed. So similarly, he thought that comets are like, you know, whiffs of gas burning in the atmosphere, right? But uh, now we know that comets are, are not, they're, they're not located in the atmosphere at all, right? They're far uh, beyond the atmospheric, uh, you know, the domain. So similarly, earthquakes also, he had you know, very similar uh, ideas about how earthquakes occur. And so there are a lot of these uh, speculations about physics are quite wrong. So just like, you know, speculation about the so-called seat of the soul. Now, if you go to Galen, right? So Aristotle is not a biologist per se, although he speculated about biology also among many other things. But Galen is a, is a physician of those days. He, is an, he did extensive anatomical studies. Uh, so he has dissected the animal bodies, oxes, oxen, lions, and tigers, and cats, and dogs, pigs, apparently spayed insects. So he is, uh, he is a big expert on animal bodies, and he also studied animal brains. So for example, in this book called On the Brain, right, uh, he is, uh, describes how to dissect an ox's brain. So he says when the part, uh, that means uh, the brain is suitably prepared, 
right? You see the dura mater and slice straight cuts on both sides of the midline down to the ventricles, right? You'll observe. Uh, so, uh, so you'll observe the third ventricle between the between two other two anterior ventricles and a fourth behind it. So basically, it shows that uh, these people knew very well the overall structure of the brain. I mean, it's not human brain, but uh, it's an ox's brain. But then these mammalian brains are very sim very similar, you know, gross structure, right? They all have two hemispheres and four lobes and the ventricles, you know, four cavities, fluid-filled cavities called ventricles and so on and so forth. So then let's fast forward a little bit, come to the 8th century. So 750 to 1250 AD, roughly, that period is called the golden age of the Arab world or the golden age of the Islamic world. Right, so there is a lot of progress in mathematics, astronomy, and uh, medicine, surgery, and all that. You know, in, during, the, during the period in the Arab world, so Al Zahrawi is a well-known neurosurgeon of those days. Uh, he uh, used to work with all sorts of you know, complex, or sophisticated uh, instrument. These are all I mean, basically different kinds of knives, right? And he was uh, well-known as a as a good neurosurgeon of those of those times. Then if you come to Europe, right, uh, so around 1250s when the golden age of Arab world has kind of started, there's a decline in that period. And uh, Renaissance started around the same time in Europe, in Western Europe. So Renaissance is, represents a special epoch in European history when uh, simultaneously there was a deep and many-sided cultural revolution, a cultural reformation uh, that occurred in painting, sculpture, music, architecture, urban design, uh, literature, and even you know, philosophy and religion. So it's spread even to religion, it's called reformation. So Renaissance, the word itself means uh, rebirth. It's a French word that uh, means rebirth. So such a grand multi-sided uh, you know, development and innovation, creativity in so many different branches of you know, human endeavor occurred in different parts of Europe, all simultaneously, over, which was spread out over three centuries. So there are many stalwarts who represent that whole spirit of Renaissance. And the most famous among them is uh, Leonardo da Vinci, which you know, might have all heard of that name. So we know Leonardo da Vinci as a painter of the famous painting Mona Lisa, which is in Louvre Museum in Paris now. But so actually not many paintings of Leonardo have survived as you know, survived today. So most famous is Mona Lisa, but the other paintings like the Virgin of the Rocks, which I'm showing here, and Genevieve and a few others, but my favorite is Virgin of the Rocks because the, this painting is one of the most beautiful female characters, I think, that uh, has ever come out of a Western artist's uh, brush. Leonardo da Vinci had an immense curiosity about everything that you saw around him. It's not, he's not just a painter. He was also a sculptor. He also written about urban design. He wrote how cities must be designed, ideal cities must be designed. right? And uh, he thought of entire cities which are built in two levels. An upper level will have you know vehicles and running around and lower level will have shops and storage and all that. It was very futuristic. Uh, so he also has uh, he's an engineer. He has designed uh, proposed designs for a submarine, for a helicopter and so on. He didn't build them so we don't know. Um, later people verified and tried to build them that they didn't work as well as what he imagined. But I mean it's amazing that Right, almost four or five centuries ago, he has thought of all these things. Then in physics, he worked a lot, did a lot of, lot of work on optics. Uh, he also did some work on botany. Uh, then, uh, so he was also interested in anatomy, right? Because why is a painter interested in he's, he's generally very curious, so he studied everything. So that is one thing. In addition to that, he was interested in anatomy because he's an artist. But artist is supposed to draw human form. Right, and uh, when you draw human form, especially in the Western artistic tradition, they were very particular that uh, your uh, pictures or depictions of human form must be very accurate and realistic, deeply realistic. So for that, uh, when you are drawing a human form, right, you know you should understand the musculature and every tiny muscle, right, must be captured very accurately. So for that, you need to study the form just the way a doctor but studies a body, right? You need to the artist should study the body. So for that purpose, he would actually uh, get uh, dead bodies of executed criminals, right, and bring them to his uh, studio and uh, and perform dissections on that and to study anatomy in great detail. 
Now, those days, there was some kind of a uh, ban against <clears throat> the section of human bodies uh, by the by church, by religion, because uh, human body is supposed to be sacred. You cannot just cut it and study it as if it's an object. But you can dissect animal bodies. So a lot of physicians used to dissect animal bodies and use that knowledge as a substitute for knowledge, you know, to knowledge of human body, which is which landed in them in problems on you know, many occasions. So Leonardo studied bodies and he studied uh, internal organs and uh, you know he even studied a pregnant woman and looked at the fetus in the uterus and studied you know the fetus and all that. So he's uh, he's done a lot of studies of brain. Uh, so and uh, he had the idea of various layers of the brain. So he compared the layers of the brain with uh, onion layers. He said they look like onion layers. So, for example, he says that when you to get to the brain, you must first remove the layer of the hair. So you need to shave off the head first, then remove the scalp, so the thin skin, then the fleshy layer underneath. Then you get to the <clears throat> skull, the cranial, cranial wall, and below that you have the dura mater. And then you have, uh, you know, arachnoid, the subarachnoid space and arachnoid space and all that. And the, then you have pyomatter and then the, the brain proper starts. So he had an idea about all these uh, layers of the brain. And he knew about ventricles, he knew about nerves, which come out of the brain. So if you kind of turn brain upside down, from the bottom you see some wires sticking out. <laughs> These are the nerves going to different parts of the body. So he knew about all that. So just about the same time, the scientific revolution also has begun. Uh, you know, people like Galileo and uh, Copernicus, and they started looking at uh, some of the fundamental assumptions in, in, in astronomy and various and other branches of science. Particularly, Galileo has uh, perfected and popularized this experimental method. He, you know, before that, people used to apply logic and you know try to come to arrive at a truth. But Galileo emphasized that ultimately to find the truth of anything in, in physics, in the physical world, in science. You have to perform an experiment, and then whatever the experiment says is correct. That's the that's, that's ultimate truth. All, all your arguments, you can make any number of arguments, but ultimately only when it is supported by the experiment, your proposal or your argument is correct. Right? So they, so that modern science, therefore, has, has been placed very securely on the foundation of the experimental method, the scientific method. So until then, people had a lot of understanding of brain at the gross scale, right? the overall shape of the brain. But they didn't know much about what brain is like at the microscopic level. Right? Because the real action in the brain is occurring at microscopic level. Now you don't see much happening at the gross level. Right? So what is it like down there at the, at the, at the level of my, microcosm? So the first uh, you know, attempt in that direction was done by people like you know, Robert Hooke, and who used a microscope, a very crude early microscope, to look at living tissue. And he found that uh, even a cork, right, for example, Right, uh, is made up of small cells, and they look at other other tissues, and you can you can even see the onion cells, right? You know, and you look at a slice of an onion in a microscope. So they they began to understand that everything in the living world is made up of the small units called cells. So brain is no different. So, uh, so that was the beginning of you know what happens, uh, you know what it is like, right? and understanding what it is like as level of uh, micros microscopic uh, scales in the brain. Now, to understand how these cells are uh, distributed and how they talk to each other and all that, we, we need one more idea. And that idea has come in a way from Descartes and several others, actually. It's not just Descartes. But Descartes has made a very important contribution in the very early stages of the Western science. right? Because before Descartes, for a long time, uh, to establish any scientific truth, people constantly use and invoke uh, relig religious ideas. Right. So, for example, in astronomy, right, if you ask why are planets round, the argument would be something like, you know, uh, the sphere is a perfect shape and God likes perfection. Therefore, planets are created as spheres. Or, uh, no, so they're round. Okay. Why are planetary orbits round? Right. Why are they circular? First of all, they are not circular, but for a long time, people thought uh, they're circular, at least some planetary or orbits, like that of moon and sun. Again, the argument is very similar, right? So the circle is a perfect uh, curve, and God likes perfection. Therefore, the planetary orbits are perfect circles. So, like that's those kind of nonsensical explanations, where for everything you say, God made it like this, and that's why it is like this. So that doesn't—it's not an explanation. It's just a random 
right? You are actually hijacking explanation, any effort to explain explain things, right? In any investigative uh, spirit is completely destroyed by simply invoking the idea called God. People think they have explained something, but they don't explain anything. So, but church is very insistent that, you know, people accept that God created the world and everything is designed by God in certain fashion, so on and so on. You can so you can't really investigate, therefore. So Descartes made a beautiful compromise between people who are seeking a physics space or physical explanation and people from the religious side who want to, who insist that everything is created by God in certain fashion. So Descartes has agreed with the religious people that God has created the universe. So fine, he said God created the universe. But he said once he God created the universe, he created this universe based on certain laws, fundamental laws. And once the universe is created, it runs by itself, right, governed by these laws. And after that, God basically stepped back and said, okay, you run by yourself. So therefore, if you're interested in understanding how the universe works, we don't have to worry about what God is thinking right now. But you just have to uh, understand these laws and you can explain everything that happens in the world. So it's a very nice compromise. Both sides are happy when he said that. So uh, that actually unleashed a lot of excellent effort uh, at understanding the physical world using physical arguments and physical insights and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so people started coming up with explanations as to, again, how brain works, how, how nervous system works. So for example, uh, take a simple activity like, like reflex action. So when you touch something hard, you, by mistake, you put your finger in fire, right? You know, you, you may have to withdraw it because you feel that pain. How does it happen? It's called reflex action in modern language. How does it happen? So the, the explanation, the traditional explanation in Descartes' time is that, uh, so when you touch something hot, that's, that information is carried by some kind of special liquids flowing through pipes that they flow, flow through the hand, reach the brain. And this liquid then goes to the brain and then it, it reaches some kind of a central elements in the brain. They didn't know what it is, they just speculate. And from there, it liquids flows back to the hand and pulls the hand back. Okay, they, they, so they had some Greek or Latin mumbo jumbo to explain this liquid because nobody has seen that liquid. And they called it animal spirits or pneuma uh, psychicon in Greek or spiritus animalis in Latin. So they invoked some kind of a fluid and uh, this fluid is not blood, by the way. It's uh, some the, it, they know that it's not blood, uh, it's something else. But they didn't know exactly what it is. Now you might be wondering, why do we have to invoke this fluid, right? What is this obsession with fluid? And in the ancient world, I mean, everything is fluid, you know, heat is fluid, energy is fluid, and there is vacuum is fluid because people thought there is this fluid called ether that filled the entire universe and so on. So people have searched for ether for centuries and nothing happened. They didn't find anything. That was the basis of Einstein's relativity. So, uh, but why is this obsession with fluid? Because Right. If, the, if you look at uh, I mean, the, the Renaissance period, I'm talking about like several centuries ago, there was no electricity at that time. They didn't have electric machine. That was very recent. I mean, like you know, late 19th century. But they used to run. They knew a lot about hydraulic engineering. That means by flow, you know, flowing by flowing uh, fluids, they could operate uh, fountains and so on. So if you Google for uh, Renaissance gardens, that very extensive waterworks in these gardens. And they they were they all they were designed centuries ago and they don't use electricity. You just have you just have to pump water to a high point, right? And then after that, the flowing water right is distributed in all these different uh, pipes and so on, and fountains and so on. So it used to look beautiful, and so you could do a lot of things with uh, hydraulic engines. So people thought that that's the only kind of machine that they knew. So people thought that body is also like a hydraulic engine. So this obsession with fluid comes from there. So now if you think about it, so this uh, some fluid has to go through the hand, go into the brain and come back and body is full of cells, brain is also full of cells. So what is the conclusion that comes from that, right? So if fluid has to go through all the cells of the brain and come back through the hand, then it, there must be a passage going from cell to cell inside the brain. So that means all the cells in the brain must be networked in such a way that the fluid goes from cell to cell. So it's a special kind of a cellular network. They, such networks are called a syncytium. So where they form a network where fluid flows from cell to cell. Okay, so that was the assumption, right? But then people actually wanted to, this is only like a logical consequence, but uh, they, nobody actually have seen the cells so closely 
to see right there is a there's a actually a corridor connecting to neighboring cells to right or is are they separated the problem with looking at this brain cells is that they are almost transparent even in a if you look at a crude microscope right there since they look transparent very hard to delineate the borders of the cells and so on you need a very powerful microscope or you need to do something else so that something else was done by the italian scientist named camillo golgi this was late 19th century and early 20th century right so he found a special developed a special staining tech so basically there's a way of there's a way of adding color to this neuron this cells which were later named neurons so when you when you introduce this dye that was picked up by these cells and they they light up they they take on a certain color so now if you look at them through the microscope you can at least see the outline of the cell because now it has some kind of a color so this is called golgi stain and uh, this method is used in biology labs all over the world even now so then uh, the spanish scientist called ramon y cajal right uh, has taken this golgi staining technique and applied this to different brain tissue because brain is very complex and different parts of the brain have different kinds of cells and so on so he took slices from different parts of the brain stained these tissues and looked at them through whatever microscope was available at that time he was also from the same period the late 19th century early 20th century and he has seen these tissues and found this beautiful cells with extensive wiring i mean each cell looks like a whole tree actually so you see these pictures uh, incidentally these pictures are not photographs these are pictures hand drawn by kahal uh, by just looking at these pictures through a microscope but now we have such nice technology you can not only look at the microscope through the microscope you can also take a photograph of that but they didn't have that so they had to do hand draw mm. so now when he saw these uh, cells more closely he got the feeling that uh, brain cannot be a sensation right the cells are probably not connected such a way that fluid can flow from cell to cell he said that you know cells cells are independent they are all totally disconnected from each other and he called that kind of a cell a neuron why did he call it a neuron because if you think of uh, the early 21st 20th century that was a time when a lot of work was going on in in particle physics and you know in terms of study of microscopic world so all these particles as atomic atom and subatomic particles that they were discovering one after another protons electrons and neutrons and all they were all named as you know proton electron some kind of an on at the end right so because they are all particles they are all well separated from the uh, from other particles so similarly a, a cell in the brain which is well separated from other cells is like a, one of those arms so he called it a neuron okay so the, and now we call this a neuron doctrine that uh, they were well separated from each other and a typical neuron the cell neuron is looks like this uh, so it has a, a cell body called soma and then there is a long wire called axon this axon uh, kind of branches out into smaller branches called axon collaterals or its branches on the other hand other side it has a smaller branches uh, called the dendrites and so on and so forth this all this was worked out a bit later but uh, but now if you ask the question how do neurons connect with each other because the crucial question is do, do they form a sensation or do they are they connected so the connection between two neurons it occurs at a small junction called a synapse it was not clear at that point uh, whether there is a continuous order or is a really a separation right so uh, because that separation you couldn't see the separation well kahal couldn't see the separation well so now with the electron microscopes and all that very powerful microscopes you can see that separation this is that small separation so it, you can it's about 100 nanometers or nanometer is 10 power minus 9 that is like 1000th of a millimeter right so like a 150 nanometers that's a thickness so uh, kahal couldn't have seen such a small gap but he this is guessed right that neurons are separated isolated from each other fine so how do these neurons work right so we said uh, they are separated so now you cannot be imagining any more that they carry fluid and fluid goes from cell to cell that whole idea and whole theory of animal spirits all that you have to toss to the window so now how do neurons work how do they talk to each other okay so th the answer to that question again came from early work of luigi galvani another italian researcher from 18th century so galvani was studying uh, electrical responses in frogs right or in animal tissue 
So if you look at this was uh, 18th century, right? So we didn't have electrical machines, electrical circuits. We didn't know about flowing electricity at that time. We knew only about electrical charge. So electrical charge is very easy, right? If you rub certain kinds of materials, you know, you produce static electricity, and right, you might have done these experiments in your school, for example, right? Take a comb and brush your dry hair, and you will see that it will attract the small bits of paper. You know, that's static electricity. That knowledge people had for a long time. So there is also this device called a Leyden jar, which can be used to store static electricity. So you can store a static electricity, some charge in that Leyden jar, and charge up a rod. And now uh, what Galvani has found, but one of his assistants by accidentally touched a frog's leg. This was a kind of a dead frog. Yeah. There is a recently dead frog. And the leg twitched as if it's still alive. I mean, the, the frog is gone. It's only like the body is cut off. Only legs were hanging. And uh, somebody touched that exposed muzzle of the leg with this uh, charged rod, and the leg twitched. Now, how does a leg normally twitch? Uh, because of a signal coming from inside the fly, you know, the live animal. But now the animal is dead, but it's still responding as if uh, you know, it is still alive. So, which means that there's something about electricity and movement, right? Electricity and body control, right? Uh, so, that is probably actually, if you kind of touch the nerve inside the muzzle, right? That will also produce the same kind of a twitch. So the link between electricity and, and the nerves and nerve system and the brain, right? That was how, that's how it, was, it has begun. Now if you fast forward a couple of centuries, you know, in the early part of last century, a lot of understanding that, you know, brain is a big electrical organ. It's an electrically active organ. And in the 1924, uh, German scientist Hans Berger has actually placed electrodes on. You know, by this time we had electrical motors, we had power systems, and so it was. You know, electricity, electrical engineering is fully right, fully uh, developed by that time. Uh, we didn't have uh, electronic circuits and all that. That came much later, but we had electrical machines and all that by that time. So people placed electrodes on on the scalp and were able to record what we call brain waves in popular terms, but with more formally, it is called electroencephalogram. That they could see that you know these uh, waves have are made up of different frequencies and depending upon the state of the mind, the state of the brain, these frequencies change and so on. So all these things were uh, like they, they they could know based on EEG. But the next question is: so we know that no system is electrical in nature; it's like electric circuit. But where is the electricity coming from? How is the electricity generated? Because electricity in a battery, we know how it works. But how does brain's electricity work? Right. So that uh, work was done by these two British scientists, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley. So they have taken, uh, so they wanted to understand how a nerve fiber, right, a nerve uh, produces electricity. But thing is, nerve fiber is actually very small, very minute. Its diameter will be of the order of like a few microns, right? That's a thousand part of uh, millimeter, right? So, and a thousand part of that is a nanometer. So, uh, so, uh, so the thing is, they needed. They didn't have very, very. You need a really small, very mind microscopic electrode to penetrate such very thin fibers, right? So, so since they didn't have that kind of technology, they took. They were looking for a nerve fiber which is also itself very thick. And where will you get such a thick nerve fiber? Only in a large animal, right? So they located this uh, giant squid, uh, right, which is a large animal. And you might have seen uh, this giant squid in some of the movies like uh, Pirates of Caribbean, which is, of course, an animated giant squid. It's not real giant squid. But a real giant squid also has uh, thick nerves. The, the single nerve fiber will be like, you know, as thick as about a couple of millimeters, which is super thick. So they've taken that and then penetrated that with uh, whatever microelectrodes they have. This was all done in the 50s, the 1950s and so on. So, and then they recorded the voltage signal inside that uh, fiber because it's carrying electricity, right? And they found that the signal carried in the nerve fiber is as a very strange shape, is a, like a very sharp spike, right? And uh, they called that an action potential. They also did in-depth studies to find out exactly what is how, is, how is it constructed? So they studied about sodium channels and production channels and all that. I, I can't go into all those details at this point because it's a slightly simpler general talk. So they found that right there, there's the voltage of the action potential. It, it rapidly goes towards, because the normal voltage inside nerve fiber is at a negative value. 
about uh, minus 70 millivolts. For comparison, you are in a voltage in your house, right? your power lines is 220, milli 220 volts. A millivolt is one thousandth of a volt. This is about minus 70 millivolts. So it rapidly goes to minus 70 to about say plus 30 and again goes back to minus 70 and comes back to the baseline. So that's the kind of signal you see in an action potential. So now this action potential, this sharp spike, it propagates down the axon, this fiber of a neuron. At, you know, at quite rapidly. Only thing is, it's not as fast as signals that go through right uh, your reticular cable, because the cable, the velocity of propagation cable is like you no know, uh, close to uh, compared with that of light speed. That's why people are able to use this transatlantic cables for telegraphy, right? You know, if you press, you know, if you're doing Morse code, like in the West, Western Europe, you could hear that very quickly, you know, in in, in the, across the Atlantic in, in Northern America, right? So that, those cables are much faster. Here, the speeds are about 100 meters per second. So it is uh, very quite slow, right? Uh, but that's the kind of speed that you have in no fibers. Okay, so like that, the signal goes a lot uh, through the axon, which is the end of the axon. So then what happens, right? Because in the earlier world, when people thought neurons are all connected, that something goes from one neuron to another because there's a direct corridor connecting different cells. That's what people imagine in the syncytium model. But now the sensation model is gone. Neurons are all disconnected. If they're all disconnected and isolated, uh, how can one neuron talk to other neuron? How does the signal go from one neuron to other? Right. So, so for that, we need to again go back to right, some of the things that people have been doing uh, in, in the ancient world. So, for example, uh, people uh, hunters used to use poisoned arrows. Right. The tip, the uh, the arrow tip was tipped in some kind of a toxin. When you hit the animal with that, this is this guy is using a blowpipe here, but you can you do the same thing with an arrow. When it hits the animal, the it will immobilize the muscles of the animal and it will fall. It cannot run anymore, so you can go catch it. These are neurotoxins. These are special chemicals which act on the nerve and the muscle and kind of deactivate, slow down the function of the nerve or the muscle. So that means which shows that chemicals can act on nerves or nerve tissue, neural tissue. Right, so that's a piece of evidence. We'll use it later. Also, chemicals can act on brain, which we know very well. You know, if somebody has a glass of beer or some alcohol, right? You feel drowsy and so on. Right, and that's the kind of thing you use in anesthetic also. So chemicals can act on the brain. That's something you know from even common knowledge. So incidentally, there's a little joke uh, that uh, or a funny incident that occurred in C. V. Raman's life, the great Indian physicist. Uh, C. V. Raman was a total teetotaler. He, he never. Uh, tasted a drop of uh, alcohol. Uh, so at a party, somebody offered him a glass of wine or alcohol. And apparently this is what Raman was supposed to have said. Because Raman is known for his, got his Nobel Prize for what is called Raman effect. Right, how, about how light scatters in certain, certain kinds of materials. So when somebody offered him some alcohol, he joked. He said, I want to study the Raman effect in alcohol, uh, but not the effect of alcohol on Raman. So he politely Kind of you know, rejected that offer. So alcohol is another example that you know chemicals can act on the brain, right? But exactly how can chemical act on the brain? And what you know, what happens at level of molecules? So those ideas say that well, the interesting ideas are proposed to answer that question. So for example, John Langley has said when a drug is acting, a chemical is acting on a cell, like a neuron, it's not directly acting on the neuron. On the neuron side also must be some other molecule. And the drug molecule must be kind of acting on that molecule, which will, which he called it some kind of a receiving molecule, a molecule which receives the action of the drug, and therefore he called it a receptor. And it's all speculation, imagination. They couldn't actually see any such molecule. It's only it's only speculation. So and these two, when the these two bind, that will produce some change in the neuron, and neurons function changes. So he called these receptor substances, uh, receptor, you know, uh, re receiving substances, receptors. So then if there are molecules on the cells which can receive the action of a chemical, so that also opened up uh, other ap approaches to therapeutics, right? Because if the molecule and the receptor have very tight coupling, and if you can come up with, if you can think of chemicals which can exclusively act on only certain kind of receptor, that will open up, uh, open avenues to, for a very nice kind of treatment. Uh, so Paul Herlich said that if that is the case, then why not design chemicals 
right, which can act specifically on certain kinds of receptors and activate it or deactivate it or whatever, which can have very special effects on a cell, right, maybe lead to the cell's dysfunction by that binding, right? And he calls such uh, designer molecules like the magic bullets, because they're like a special bullet which can only hit that receptor and for that cell. And if that cell happens to be some kind of a germ, which is producing a disease, and if you can act, deactivate that germ by hitting it with a special that magic bullet molecule. And that's a very cool kind of a treatment. This is all I'm talking about, like, you know, late 19th century and all that. These are kinds of things that people are thinking. So for uh, all these things to work, right, one crucial question is, do cells talk to each other through chemicals, right? All these other data that I mentioned shows that, I mean, cells probably have a machinery to respond to chemicals. But what is that machinery doing normally? Because the other guys have talked about drug action, you give a medication, right? How is it acting on cells? But then if cells have such, such receptor molecules, you must be using it all the time, not just when some drug is injected by some doctor, right? And they're constantly talking to each other. So the question now is, does a neuron talk to another neuron through a, through a chemical, right? So they didn't know that because like I said, the synapse is a very small area. It's very hard to find out what's going on in that very narrow gap. So that uh, mystery was first kind of uh, kind of dispelled by this very slick experiment by Otto Levy. Now Otto Levy was thinking about this question: How do you prove or disprove that uh, cells communicate using chemicals? So apparently, as it is the story goes like this: He was thinking about this problem, and one day he was working in the lab and he slept off. Actually, you know, he was it was at home and he had a dream. In that dream, he saw an experimental setup of how, what kind of experiment you can show, you can perform to prove this. And uh, he, he uh, kind of, right, he woke up and thought it's interesting and slept off again. We also do that. We get some interesting dream, and, right? We sleep off and then next morning, we only have a vague, uh, you know, memory that we had an nice dream, but we don't know what the hell the dream is. That right? is very common. So same thing happened to him, but really kicked himself because you know, it was a, it was a very important dream, right? So he felt very bad and forgot about it. And the following night again he got the same dream. This time he had the good sense to get up and actually note down the contents of the dream, right? So he did that, and then next day he went to the lab and performed that experiment, and that experiment has succeeded wonderfully and it got him a Nobel Prize. So make sure you note down your dreams because you know you don't know if there's an old prize sitting somewhere there, you know, one of those dreams. So the experiment goes something like this. So for this experiment, he used uh, tiny hearts. I think it's a frog heart. Uh, and you can preserve a heart and keep it beating in a special bath called the Ringer solution. So he has taken uh, two frog hearts, right? Both are... Uh, so and and uh, the first heart is kept, like both are beating. And uh, he also has taken, there's a nerve called vagus nerve, which, which is connected to the heart. And this nerve, when you activate that nerve, it will slow down the heart beat. So he's taken that, he put this heart in one beaker, right? And then electrically activated the vagus nerve. So that will slow down the first heart. Then he has taken a little bit of medium, the surrounding medium from the first beaker and injected that, that liquid into the second beaker. When he did that, the heart in the second beaker slowed down, which is quite fascinating because to slow down the heart, normally you would have to activate the vagus nerve. Only the first heart had vagus nerve, second heart didn't. So only thing that he moved from first beaker to second beaker is that liquid from surrounding medium. And when he did that, the second heart also slowed down. The only conclusion that you can draw from this is that when the vagus nerve was activated, it must have released some chemical that chemical must have gone into the medium of the first beaker. And when he took some medium from the first beaker and put it in the second beaker, the same chemical has gone to the second beaker. And that chemical must have acted on the heart right, and slowed it down. So it means a beautiful experiment. It doesn't cost anything. It will probably cost you like a few hundred rupees uh, to perform an experiment like, experiment like this. And that got him a Nobel Prize. So, so when people sometimes complain that, oh, we need a lot of funding, crores and crores of funding to do you know, significant research and all that. I mean, this kind of experiment show that you don't need funding, you just need to have, right, this uh, to perform intelligent experiments. So now, later on, people have worked it out in great detail that, you know, what the kind of signal that goes from one 
neuron to other neuron. This is a form of a chemical. That chemical is called a neurotransmitter. And actually, the machinery that en that enables this, what makes this happen, is extremely complicated. And people study just like you know one half of this synapse, right? Pretty much in their whole lifetimes. Okay, it's so the molecular machinery that makes it happen is so complicated. Is so complicated that you know, it takes decades of effort to complete and rival all the parts of this machine. So that's what makes brain very interesting and very complex to study. Now, if that is the case, then let us talk about how brain works at a large scale. Right? That's how neurons work. Right? They're electrical. They also use chemical signals for communication. So if that is the case, then how does the brain work as, at, at large scale? Now, let's begin this story with uh, a kind of a now we know it's a pseudoscience. It's a science called phrenology. Phrenos means mind or mind and all log ology, log logos is uh, science. That's science of mind. So there's a strange science called phrenology, right? Uh, where people used to think that by feeling the surface of the head, not even the brain, surface of the head, by feeling the bumps on the head, you can tell about the person's character. So how does this logic work? So basically these guys used to believe that different functions or different qualities or characteristics of a person are uh, located at different parts of the brain right so for example in this uh, picture you can see that uh, so uh, time is located here memory is located here language is under the eyes and emotiveness that is loving romantic nature is located here conjugal love friendship is so it's just total rubbish i mean people just made up these maps and people thought that you know that all these different things are located in different parts of the brain that's the first point which is a total rubbish the second step in the logic is so if a given quality is very strong in a given person let us say a person has is very friendly so that means a friendly nature is located in this part of the brain so in this person uh, that part of the brain must is supposed to have a very large volume and because of that, it, so when uh, different parts of the brain have this kind of differential volumes, these little local bumps in the brain keep pushing upwards, outwards into the skull. And so these little bumps in the brain will also show up as bumps in the in the skull. So if you just feel around the skull and look at, you know, feel the local bumps in this in the skull, right? You can tell, for example, uh, if there's a little bump in the head in somewhere there, you should can kind of guess that the person is very friendly which is absolute rubbish. Uh, so, but the thing is, this science was very popular. That's why we call it a pseudoscience. There's no evidence, right, of any, for any of this stuff. It was very popular and people used to make a lot of money. So there was a time when people asked to impose taxes on these guys because they're making so much money. So this was happening in Europe, in US also, this was quite popular. Then this information came to the notice of the Emperor Napoleon in France. Napoleon was very scientifically minded. He didn't like this kind of a mumbo jumbo where just people say anything, anything goes. That he didn't like that. So, so he asked one of the court physicians to take up this question, and you know he wanted to promote scientific temperament in his empire. And he he, he called this guy called uh, Jean Pierre Florence to investigate this problem quite thoroughly, experimentally, and rigorous using scientifically rigorous methods, and sort out of the issue. What is the issue? Is there some kind of a really uh, localized representation of various functions or characteristics in the brain? Or is it opposite, right? So Jean-Pierre Florence has taken up that question. He's taken some experimental animals, right? And kind of damaged brain at different parts and observed the behavior. And his conclusion was that uh, no matter, you know, it doesn't matter where you damage the brain. It's only the overall extent of the damage that determines uh, the changes in its behavior. First of all, I mean, this kind of surgery, surgical experiments must have been very crude uh, because it's done like, you know, what, uh, late uh, 18th century and all that, or early 19th century. They must have been very crude. But anyway, he has a point that the uh, brain functions are not super localized, they're somewhat distributed. And he, he uh, made, you know, declared that conclusion. And with that, they had to kind of reject uh, all the pseudosciences like uh, phrenology. Then came this British neurologist called uh, Fugling Jackson, again, late 19th century, early 20th century. He was studying patients who suffer from epilepsy, suffer from epileptic seizures. So what he said is, uh, 
right? So when you see, a, I don't know if you have ever had a chance to person who is, you know, because epileptic uh, treatments have improved a lot, and you don't see that many patients in you know around us all these days. But when I was small in my school, we almost always used to have some child, you know, one of my classmates who who used to get fixed, what we call fixed, you know, once in a while. And they used to tell us you need to put some keys in the hand. Apparently, that's not correct. Okay, so when you see a person who is seizing, now you see this kind of you know behavior. So usually the seizure starts at the terminals, like that's the fingertips, and from there it spreads to the wrist, from there it spreads to the elbow and spreads to the shoulder and spreads to the entire body. And if you're standing, at that time you lose your control, you lose your balance, and you fall and so on. So. On. So Hubling Jackson observed this pattern in which uh, seizure spreads through the body, and he had a very beautiful insight. He said, uh, "Why is there this kind of systematic spreading of the seizure from one end of the hand to the shoulder and so on?" He said, "Probably in the brain, uh, distinct parts of the brain control different parts of the hand. For example, there is probably one part of the brain which controls fingers." Another part controlling the elbow, another part controls uh, right the, the wrist and elbow and so on and so forth, right? And that's the first insight. Second insight is that maybe some kind of abnormal electrical activity is starting from the part of the brain which controls fingers. That's why fingers start shaking first. And from there, this abnormal electrical activity is probably spreading to nearby regions. The way a forest fire spreads in a forest, right? Are you the burning starts in one point and spreads in all directions. Similarly, this abnormal electrical activity is, starts in the finger area of the brain. From there, it spreads to the wrist area and on the elbow area and so on and so forth. So, which means that, right, uh, different parts of the brain control different parts of the body in a very precise way, right? So, he didn't even do any experiments, you know, no surgeries, nothing. Just by looking at this patient, right, he had this idea, his insight that different parts of the brain control different parts of the body, which is very beautiful. And it doesn't happen all the time in neuroscience. So taking up on such suggestions, uh, subsequently, uh, Wilder Penfield and others uh, have done very interesting surgical studies. Penfield is a Canadian neurosurgeon, right, who was uh, performing surgeries on brain. A lot of the surgical uh, attempts were made as a cure for epilepsy. Because in epilepsy, like I said, like like Hewling Jackson has kind of guessed, uh, the abnormal electrical activity starts in one part of the brain and spreads all over. And we have synchronized activity in different parts of the brain. So usually in one class of uh, epilepsies or temporal lobe epilepsies, this abnormal activity starts in the temporal lobe. So uh, so the only so if, if the person is not responding to drugs or medication, the only way is to surgically isolate that part of the brain. So this is called an epileptic focus. That is, this is the point from which, from where this electrical activity is spreading to the, over the entire brain. So Penfield was trying to actually locate that part, this epileptic focus, and he would surgically remove the surrounding tissue. So the problem is the epileptic focus area, right, in its visual appearance, it looks like any other neighboring tissue. So how do you identify that point? that the only way to identify it is by reticular stimulating. Because this point in the brain will be like a, it's like a flash, it's very sensitive electrically. It's like a flash point. If you pass some current there, you put an electrode and you know, apply it to the brain, pass some current there, it will immediately induce a seizure, right? So you need to just probe different points, keep on passing current and see which point will induce a seizure and then that's your target. And you have to surgically remove that part. So while he was doing these kinds of surgeries, he began probing the brain using this electrode. And he found that with a very interesting maps in the brain. So for example, when he was probing certain part of the brain, he found that the subject felt that somebody is touching him. Okay, so if you electrically activated, uh, so let's say this part of the brain, subject would feel that somebody is touching his hand and fingers. Right, if you electrically activate this part, Right, somebody they would feel that somebody is touching their trunk, right? And uh, so if you activate here, they would feel that somebody is touching their face. There's nobody there, nobody is touching it. But electrical activation of these parts of the brain will give that sensation that somebody is touching various parts of the body, which means the entire body surface, right, is mapped onto a certain small part of the brain, which we now know as 
the somatic sensory system, somatic sensory area, number one, primary somatic sensory cortex. Similarly, if you activate this other side, so both these are located, I don't have pictures of the brain here, but there's something called central sulcus, right? And uh, so in the post-central gyrus, right, you have this area where you have motor control. In pre-central gyrus, you have area where you have, you know, you process touch information. So in this uh, post-central uh, gyrus, we have areas where if you activate a given area, it produces a corresponding movement. So if you activate this part, for example, it will produce finger movements. If you activate this part, it will produce movements of the toes and so on. So if you activate this part, movement of the face muscles and so on. So when people saw that there's this whole maps in the brain, which uh, represent the entire body, so they're very excited because this is like way back in the early 20th century. So they imagine that there's some kind of a little man right now, this kind of sitting inside the inside the brain and receiving all the information from the world, from the body, and you know controlling the whole body. Right. So it's like uh, you know somebody like a crane operator sitting inside the crane, huge crane. There's a little guy sitting inside that operating the huge crane. So people thought of that uh, this brain is like a little homunculus. So they call these little maps homunculus. Homunculus means uh, homos is man and Homunculus is a little man. And in fact, they started making these little figurines, little idols, right? And, and, uh, and they would keep these idols on their tables, right? Just as a demonstration of the scientific progress that occurred in you know, those days. But now we know that it's a super simplified uh, story. It's not that simple. So then the other uh, French neurologist called Paul Broca, right? He has studied a class of patients uh, who had certain speech problems. Right, and the patients at Broca studied. Right, they could utter only one one guy who could utter only utter only one word, Tan. We could only say Tan. That's it. Right, so they called him Tan. They named him after that one word, which he would act, he was able to utter. So they could utter isolated sounds, but they cannot put together in all sentences or anything. They could hum musical tunes a little bit, but they could not frame sentences. Okay, so they they so. This kind of a speech disorder, speech disorder is called aphasia. The special kind of speech disorder, which uh, Broca studied, is called Broca's aphasia. So this occurred when there's a damage to this part of the brain. So I'm just circling that. Similarly, so another Austrian uh, physician uh, has studied a different kind of aphasia, which is called, uh, this, his name is Wernicke, Karl Wernicke. So this in this aphasia, people could form nice sentences and all that. The sentences don't make much sense. So see what this guy is saying. I called my mother on the television and did not understand the door. It was too breakfast, right? But they came from far to New York. My mother is not too old for me to be young, right? So, so it's very well-formed sentences grammatically, but they don't make any sense. So kind of like sometimes reminds me of Rahul Gandhi's statements, right? So uh, this is Venaki's aphasia. So they are uh, they're able to speak. But they cannot, they don't know what they're saying because they don't understand what they're saying. Because probably the real problem is they can't understand language. Therefore, they don't even understand what they are talking. Uh, this is one problem. The other, and in this case, the damage is in this part of the brain. Uh, this is now called Wernicke's area. So then there is a third kind of a problem. So where uh, they can understand, but they cannot repeat what they've heard. They can also speak by themselves but they cannot repeat what they have heard. So why would that be happening? The only way you can imagine that is they're able to understand. So Vernicke's area is, area is good. They're able to speak by themselves. So Broca's area is good, but they're not able to repeat, which means there's no communication between Vernicke's area and Broca's area. That which is what actually happens. There's a bundle of fibers called arcuate fasciculus, which connects Vernicke's area with Broca's area. There's a damage to, somewhere there's a lesion, there's a damage to these fibers. And therefore, they are not able to repeat what they are saying. And this kind of a problem is called conduction aphasia. So when people saw these very nice examples, uh, they found some kind of a reconciliation between this, right? This uh, what is called aggregate field view, where people thought that everything controls everything, and localization view, where people found that or people guessed that different parts of the brain controls different functions, right? So the aggregate field view and localization view, the, the debate went on for a long time. 
but uh, Wernicke tried to reconcile these two uh, extreme views like this. He said, uh, if you depends on what you mean by brain function. So suppose you ask the question, is speech localized or is it distributed? Uh, so it depends on, uh, so the thing is speech has many facets to it. If you break it down, speech uh, requires language and, you know, speech or language processing, right? let's take it in a broader sense. So for language processing, you need to, one side of it is language understand, because you need to understand what somebody else is saying. Language processing could also mean, you know, producing language, right, language production. So, so language understanding or comprehension occurs in one area, that's the case area. And language production, that is speaking, occurs in different areas, as broker's area, right? And in fact, uh, even the idea of Wernicke's area is, which is a very old idea. Now we know that there's no single Wernicke's area. There are lots of clusters of areas looking at different aspects of language processing. But anyway, this is an old story. So now, uh, how do you, even that language comprehension, how do you, how do you process language? How do you receive language input into your brain? Either you are listening to somebody saying something or you are reading something, some text from a book, right? If you're reading from a book or something like that, then the input is coming through your visual mode, right? You are reading it with your eyes. So that means information first has to go through your you know, visual parts of the brain, which is somewhere here. So from there, it has to go to, uh, or if you are listening to speech sound, somebody is saying something, you're listening to that. That information has to go to your auditory areas in the brain, that's somewhere here. Right, and all these now have to uh, then send that information to the Wernicke's area, which is language proper is processed. Then if you want to, let's say you're reading aloud something, right, the input has to come to the visual area. That has to go to, go to the Wernicke's area. Then that has to go to Broca's area. Then Broca's area then sends signals to motor areas, which will activate your face muscles and your tongue, and larynx, and you know your whole, what is called articulatory apparatus. Right, so if you ask the question, is language localized? That's a very kind of broad question. The language has so many parts to it. So each of these different parts of this broad thing called language and speech, right, that is conducted by local specialized areas in the brain. But they all work together as a large network. And that's how the whole language processing, right, or language function is conducted in the brain. So both sides are correct, but in a, depending upon the scale at which you are looking at the problem, uh, both sides are correct. So he called this style of functioning parallel and distributed processing. Okay, so, and so that, that kind of a synthesis of some of these so-called debates, which went on for a long time, gave rise to a whole, uh, in fact, it inspired a whole body of mathematics, uh, you can say it in one way, right? Uh, that describes you know, modern brain using in mathematical terms. Because generally, whenever you talk about uh, understanding of a physical system, right, especially in physics, you cannot think and you know, imagine understanding a physical system without use of mathematics. Because in physics, everything is uh, described in, in terms of equations, right? So similarly, brain is also a physical system. You it should be possible to describe it using mathematics. So that effort actually started way back, almost uh, eight years ago. In the 1940s, right, the two people, Makalo and Pitts, uh, Makalo is a physicist, physiologist, and Pitts is a mathematician who was a postdoc with him. These two guys have begun to uh, you know, understand how brain works, how brain performs information processing. So they propose a very simple neuron model, which is which is now called Makalo and Pitts model, where it says that okay, each neuron receives inputs from some bunch of other neurons. It combines all those inputs and produces an output. And the output is again sent to a bunch of other neurons. And this information like that is circulating through the brain. The only thing is uh, the way they described a single neuron, right? They they had a computer in the back of the mind as a comparison. Because they, they right away, right in the beginning, they imagined that brain is like a computer. Why is that? Because the brain is very smart. And uh, computer was just becoming popular in those days. This was the 1940s. And the World War was going, Second, Second World War was going on at that time. And people had just built this large computer called the ENIAC in the 40s. I think it was located in the University of Pennsylvania or someplace. It, this is a huge thing, and they would fill like you know huge halls. And this, this was used to crack enemy secret codes and you know, to plan, you know, missile trajectories and things like that. So, what is the basis of uh, 
computer, I mean, you have this Boolean logic and you have logic gates and all those things. So then people, so if you look at a computer, it's filled with this kind of, you know, circuits made up of logic gates. So then it was very natural to think of brain as a computer because both are smart. Uh, and so they were, they thought of neurons as implementing some kind of logic gates, the AND gates and OR gates and all this. They, they're quite wrong in that, that respect. But anyway, that was a very good start. So subsequently, this kind of neuron models have inspired other kinds of neuron models and they kept on developing. And so if I, I, I cannot cover the whole history of development of this mathematical neuroscience, which is now called computational neuroscience. I mean, which, right, eight years of history, but in, in a few minutes. But uh, I'll just say that this field has expanded a lot, immensely, in the, especially in the last couple of decades. There are lots of conferences. What is this field about? The field is about describing brain functions using mathematics, using mathematical theories, right? And this math has become so sophisticated, so advanced these days. There are lots of textbooks and lots of journals and lots of conferences, right? Immense amount of work happening the world over. So with these changes, uh, so the, 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 our ability to explain brain has improved a lot. And uh, so now we have, I mean, we made a lot of progress in our in, in developing, proposing brain theories of different or you know, subsystems in the brain. Like brain has many different parts, like in the cerebellum, and basal ganglia, hippocampus, hypothalamus, thalamus, and so on. How do these structures work in the brain? I mean, we have we don't have complete story. We don't have the final answer, uh, unfortunately, because of some issues which I'll describe maybe in another talk. But uh, we have made a lot of progress over the last half a century or so. Right. But definitely what happens is it is worth uh, looking at what the mathematical neuroscientists have discovered and about brain. And uh, so what happens is all these developments are completely confined to the to engineering domains, to people who know physics, mathematics, engineering, that kind of community. If you look at the medical community, a medical would never even have heard of all these developments. Right? Why is this happening? How come? The clinical world, which we actually deal with patients and brain condition, perform surgeries and all that stuff, would never even have heard of this whole field of uh, computational or mathematical neuroscience. Uh, that's because, I mean, this, we have this artificial division between medicine and mathematics, and medicine and engineering. Right? Because when you talk about theory in medicine, theory means all these big books that you mark up for the sake of for the exams. Practicals means, you know, the dissections of dead bodies and all that stuff. That's medicine. In engineering, what is theory? Theory means mathematical theory, right? Practicals means you know, working on machines and all that stuff. So unfortunately, there's a division between these two, and I think it's high time this, we kind of plug that division and remove that division, which means that medicals have to learn mathematics, and engineers who are interested in medicine and you know, physiology, all that, should learn the medical side of things also. So with this uh, objective in mind, IIT Metros has recently started this new department called the Department of Medical Science and Technology. So here the students uh, right, not only learn engineering subjects in IIT, and they also go to a medical school, a medical college, to get trained the way medicals are trained. So this division between engineering and medicine is gone, and it's unnecessary, it shouldn't be there anymore. <coughs> so. So brain theory is evolving and you know, is experiencing explosive growth and all that, but the brain theory is not final. There's still a lot more to do, and even fundamental uh, questions are still not answered. But huge projects are going on. For example, this grand project called Blue Brain Project happening in Geneva in, you know, in Switzerland. They have very ambitious goal to literally reconstruct the entire brain in the computer. I mean, neuron by neuron, fiber by fiber, very detailed model. And they've made a lot of progress in that. So my lab, we have a much more modest goal. And my lab is called Computational Neuroscience Lab in IIT Metras. We believe that you know if you start with a simpler brain model, right, and then it should be a functional model, which explains how different parts of the brain work and how do they work together as a network, right? And this will be like a prototype, not the full brain has about 100 billion neurons. Whereas I'm talking about like a much smaller model with maybe 10 million neurons, right? But it should have a presentation of all the major structures in the brain. We call this a major brain project. It's ongoing. We are building different parts of the brain and the idea is to, over a period of time, put them all together to figure out how the whole brain works. And such a simplified model of the brain, I believe, 
will have revolutionary applications in both medicine and engineering. Uh, it will improve treatment uh, immensely, right? In the way we understand diseases, the way we treat diseases, brain disorders, will improve a lot if we have this kind of large-scale model of the brain. And uh, I mean, if you are going, if you, any of the students are interested in research, and uh, if they're engineering students, uh, if you want to do research in computational science, you're most welcome. You can apply, and or you can even do internship in my lab and things like that. So welcome to Brain Science. I hope I gave a overall simple outline of how this field has evolved. But I mean, there is every part, little part of neuroscience is so vast, right? I mean, if you call experts on the different parts, they'll keep talking for days and days. There's so much information is available. So what hope I'm able to excite you about how interesting neuroscience is and maybe we'll take up a more serious study uh, of this amazing field. So thank you. So I'll stop my slides here. Uh, uh, sir, I have uh, posted a few queries in the chat mm. box. Uh, so shall I go by the Excel sheet or the chat box? I post on chat box. So I see only two. Yes. Yeah. I'm just posting it. So, okay, okay. Yeah. How the cognitive function of the brain takes place mathematically? Uh, okay, so the question I think is, uh, how do you explain cognitive function using mathematics? I guess that's the question. The answer is, like I said, you can describe the operation of a single neuron using mathematics. And those kinds of models can be quite simple or can be very detailed. So now you have to, so when you say cognitive function, let us say, how do you recognize a pattern? So I show you letter A, and you, you recognize it and say it is letter A. So that kind of a thing can be done by a neural network model, which will describe how your visual areas uh, operate and how your speech areas operate and so on and so forth. So the kind of models I just said is very simple, but you can use them to construct large networks and explain how you take some cognitive function, like sequence processing, working memory. You can explain a lot of that stuff using network models of this kind. So that math exists. Uh, uh, yeah, so you can explain a lot of that stuff. If you want, I can give more, give you more specific papers on that. OK, so another question is, uh, when somebody dies, does the brain respond to shutdown of the nervous system and body as a whole, uh, which is same? Uh, is it same as uh, what happens in sleep? No. So the thing is, in sleep, the brain is still quite active. Okay, so the only thing that happens in sleep, uh, so you know, you have this brain frequencies, right? You know, you are starting from delta, theta, delta is uh, two to four hertz, theta four to eight hertz, and right, and alpha is eight to twelve hertz, and beta, is, and after that gamma, and so on and so forth. So when you go to sleep, the brain doesn't become inactive, or I think it's still quite active. Only thing is active, the brain's frequencies shift to lower frequencies. Right and uh, deep sleep, it is more delta and so on and so forth. But in a dead brain, so basically, what I'm that means what you know, like uh, the heart stops pumping. The moment heart stops pumping, brain doesn't get energy. There's no glucose. So about if after about a few minutes of loss of energy to the brain, the tissue dies. Right. So once tissue dies, no, there's no more brain activity. So it's uh, totally different from what happens in sleep. Okay. So next question is. Uh, how has this history of brain research influenced the development of medical and physiological practices? So the thing is, so the way I talked about in my talk, right? Development in different branches of science have led to development in understanding of that aspect of brain. So for example, our understanding of uh, neurochemicals have led to understanding of neurochemistry. You know, how do neurons talk to each other using chemicals? What is the action of chemicals on the brain? So that led us to better uh, design better drugs, right? For different class of drugs for different brain disorders. So similarly, our understanding of electrical activity of the brain has led to technologies like deep brain stimulation, or brain stimulation in general, what is called broadly called neuromodulation. So that means how do you apply uh, electrodes to the brain and activate different parts of the brain and use it as a as a means of treatment. 
Okay, so uh, so there again, you can activate the brain on the surface by applying electrodes on the surface, or you can dig an electrode deep into the brain and then activate deeper parts of the brain, which is called deep brain stimulation, and so on and so forth. Right, so depending upon our uh, development of understanding of a given uh, branch of science, right, we were able to translate that into uh, different uh, medical or uh, therapeutic practices. What are prospects for future developments in understanding of the brain and how might they be informed by historical perspectives? So one of the key problems in neuroscience, which I keep talking about in my courses also, is our understanding of the brain at large scale, at systems level. So because um, at single neuron level, we have a lot of data, but when you go to systems level, uh, we don't have a good a final theory of a single brain structure. Now, except, for example, if you look at cortex, especially if you look at the surface of the brain, which is called a cortex, at uh, primary sensory cortex level, which is very simple, which is lowest level, we have some reasonable understanding. But when moment you go to higher order cortices or any take any brain structure, we don't have a final theory. So without, without having a solid grip on at least essential principles of various brain structures, how can you treat a broken brain, right? So if you are talking about treating the brain or understanding the brain at large scale, unless we make progress in this this aspect, uh, whatever we do to treat brain will be will not be very effective. And you see that happening in clinical practice today. So personally, I think that that's where maximum progress has to be made. And once you do that, uh, that will translate into field of neurology. Neuro surgery is a slightly different thing, but if you have a better understanding of brain function. If you have better theory of brain, mathematical theory of brain, I think that will also guide your neurosurgical practices and it will minimize invasive neurosurgeries and uh, because you understand brain function better. <coughs> Next question. How to retain information to read for a longer period? So basically we have memory, memory no, retention of information, which is memory, right? Memory occurs at multiple time scales. So you have very short memory, which is called working memory. And that's the kind of memory which you use, for example, if you are, right, somebody tells you a phone number and you're dialing it. You have to show that information for a few seconds. <coughs> Once you dial the number, you can forget it. This is it. So that's working memory. Then information that you receive through the senses goes into the structure called hippocampus, which is called a scratch scratch pad of memory, right? Where it's it stays for hours to about a day or a few days. After that, in deep sleep, information gets consolidated and goes to different parts of the brain, gets distributed. This is called memory consolidation. So when you want, if you want to retain information for a longer time, this has to happen. And this happens uh, during sleep, but we fully don't know in what form it is encoded. But definitely uh, repeated exposure to that piece of information and uh, making sure you get good night's sleep, right? So that this consolidation process takes place. I mean, these two things I can suggest to inform retain information for a long time. Information ret retention also depends on interest, right? I mean, you. You bump into people and you forgot their name. And it's not that your brain is not working, but because you don't have much interest in remembering that person's name, right? You forget it. But otherwise, if you are interested and if you repeat the exposure to information, you will remember it for a long time. I want to know how does stress affect brain? Yeah, stress does affect brain because stress is the function of a brain system called the reward system. Because what happens is when you are exposed to information, we are not only, so suppose I'm looking at the, in my immediate surroundings. I see there's a laptop in front of me, there are these books and so on and so forth. I can read what they are and so on. That's what your senses will tell you. But the, the reward, what the reward system tells you is, it also estimates the goodness or the badness of my surroundings or my situation which I am. So, uh, so the thing is, so this is a, this is a, this is a so I'm going to appraisal of my situation. Take, for example, you are, uh, you know, somebody is like going through an interview 
right? The first question the, the interviewer asks, like you are able to comfortably answer it and you are happy. So your expectation or the appraisal of the situation is suddenly becomes quite positive. And a couple of other questions are also quite positive. So you think you're doing very well and you excited. You think you'll get, get that job. Then somebody else in the panel asks a very difficult question. Suddenly you kind of completely draw a blank. And then your appraisal goes down, right? So this kind of appraisal is, is dependent on the external conditions, but sometimes the appraisal can be completely detached from your external conditions. External condition could be okay, but you're somehow, because the part of the brain which is doing this appraisal, the reward system, something went wrong there. The appraisal can be quite negative, although apparently it looks quite normal or positive. So stress is coming out of those negative appraisals. So reward system kind of overacting or overreacting to a situation and making negative appraisals where it doesn't have to be that negative. The stress comes because of this. So in the same situation, some people are able to handle it. Some people are, you know, are not able to handle it and get all worked out, worked up, right? Uh, so, and uh, that kind of stress, although it seems very subjective, it does affect the brain. And uh, even when it comes to single neurons, Stress can affect even the single neuron arbors, all right? And they can arbors, the, the fibers can shrink because of stress. Uh, and how does one get out of it? So the thing is, if you love what you do, right? So try to identify a few tasks, a few activities where you love what you do. And uh, when you do that, you don't experience stress. And hopefully, and you create atmosphere of kind of joy and positivity as you do those things. And as if that becomes your core activity, then hopefully from that, this kind of a joy or stress-free manner of operation can spread to other domains. I mean, that's the only general advice I can, I can think of. Is the brain capable of creating new patterns when practiced consistently? I don't understand the question. If you practice, then it, that will improve your skill, right? Uh, so it will make you more consistent. In your performance yes because what happens is when you look at motor function for example right for example ability to throw a dart at a target so the thing is why is it that you know whenever an, an inexperienced person like me if i throw a dart it won't hit the bullseye it will go all over the place and every time i throw a dart it will go to a different point it's not it doesn't go to the same point why is it there because the way our motor system is designed is that whenever you produce a movement there's always a natural variability in the moment. It, it's there for a reason because without that, see, way we learn any skill is you do something and then there's a feedback from the environment which says that, okay, what you've done is not very good. And then you to correct that, you make a slightly different moment. Okay, and by this kind of feedback error correction, you keep on trying out different moments until you get the right so to try out different movements, your movement should have a natural variability. So that's why there's so much variability in your movements. But the problem is the same variability which is necessary for learning something, learning a skill, also becomes an impediment when you perfect that skill and make sure you have to get the exact same movement every time. So that can be done by practice uh, because it switches to a different subsystem in the brain once you practice it, right? In the early stages, it is one subsystem in the brain which is driving movement, so there's a lot of variability. But with practice, it becomes habitual, it goes to a different system, and, and there it, there is a more consistent uh, performance, and which is how sports works. So that's possible, yeah, if you have a lot of practice. Do blind people dream? My understanding is if uh, this the blindness has occurred later in life, they do dream. But it occurs early on, uh, I mean, if they're born blind, then they don't dream. But I need to check if uh, they get other kinds of dreams based on the sound, where they can hear sounds. Do they hear, do they experience completely auditory dreams? I don't know, but I need to check. Uh, <clears throat> so which kind of protein, regulatory protein in cytoplasm? This is slightly outside my domain. You should ask a molecular biologist, but my understanding is that there's so many proteins that uh, play a role in the uh, around the synapse that it's not just one protein. Uh, but I'm not an expert in that. You need to find a molecular biologist. Uh, brain function related to hearing. Okay, so they're in both lobes because uh, 
I mean, most brain functions are distributed symmetrically in, in both hemispheres, except higher functions like language, where there's an asymmetry. But if you look at basic sensory functions and motor functions, they are symmetrically located in both uh, hemispheres. But the only thing is they are located anti-symmetrically in the sense that when I process the rep part of my visual world, that is processed by my left, by sorry, right part of the visual world is processed by left brain and vice versa. Similarly, if I am controlling my right hand, that is controlled by my left brain, mostly. It's not completely, but mostly. So the basic sensory motor functions are located in both hemispheres, but higher order functions like language, for example, are typically located in the left brain, not in the right brain. Only And the only thing is the right brain supports the language function by taking care of the emotional aspects of language production. Okay, so, but there is an asymmetry. Yeah, so last question. Multiple thoughts in the brain, I'm assuming, are multiple events in the brain. How does one thought take over uh, remaining and get executed? I'm assuming this should help people to focus on productive thoughts. At the level of thoughts as an abstract thoughts, I don't know, but people are able to, now the technology is so advanced that you can pick on your thoughts using, right? So for example, using EEG also people are able to, if you think of a word, right? So I give you a list of, very short list of words. I think of one of the words, right? And from the EEG signals, I can find out with reasonable accuracy what, which word you have thought of. So similarly, if I uh, imagine as one of, from one of those small set of objects, you know, from the EEG, I can find out which object you are imagining. Or similarly, if I'm imagining moving my hand, and I'm not actually moving my hand, but I'm imagining it moving from you know, towards left or right, from EEG, I can find out which movement you are imagining. But if you're talking about more abstract thoughts and how to control, I'm not sure, sorry. Mm -hmm. So any other questions? There are no more questions. I think we can uh, wrap up. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, we have received more than 350 questions. So we okay. had to shortlist only, you know, uh, okay. 10, 15 of them. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I believe, I think there is a lot of interest uh, from the learners on this topic. And uh, at this context, I want to request you to do another session, maybe two months from now or next three sure. months. Yeah. yeah. Because I am sure brain is a very interesting topic and I'm... I'm sure very few of us know more about the brain. Uh, that's the reason there's a lot of interest from school students, teachers, college faculty, as well as college students. So very interesting, sir. Thank you uh, for this wonderful session. And I think we got a very good response from the learners as well. Thank you all the learners for participating in this session. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Chakravarti for giving his time uh, to do this wonderful session. Thank you, Professor. So thank you very much again, and uh, so hope to meet another couple of months with on a different topic of neuroscience. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Good night. Alaji, you can stop the live. So Balaji, we can hang up, right? Yeah, I was just. Uh...